the summer of 1940, Britain stood alone against Nazi Germany. The English Channel was all that separated Britain from Nazi-occupied Europe. Hitler's dazzling victories in the first nine months of World War II had stunned the world. He was now poised to overwhelm his one remaining adversary. The new British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, broadcast to the world that the Battle of France was over and that the Battle of Britain was about to begin. Churchill proclaimed that if Britain were beaten, the whole world would sink into the abyss of a new dark age. Hitler realized that for Germany to successfully invade Britain, it would first have to destroy the Royal Air Force on the ground and in the air. Britain's fate would be decided by a prolonged contest between two determined air forces. It would also be a clash of two warriors, the head of the British Royal Air Force Fighter Command, Air Chief Marshal Hugh Dowding, and the head of the German Luftwaffe, Hermann Göring. On Friday, September 1st, 1939, Hitler's war machine invaded Poland. It used blitzkrieg or lightning war tactics to secure a rapid victory. In response, Britain and France declared war on Germany two days later. The two countries quickly mobilized. They feared an immediate bombing campaign against their cities. In Berlin, the Germans feared retaliation from Allied bombers and did not launch an air offensive against the Western Allies. Hitler and his generals agreed they needed time to prepare their armies to attack France. Throughout the winter of 1939 and spring of 1940, there was a stalemate in what became known as the Phony War, or Sitzkrieg. But on May 10, 1940, the Sitzkrieg turned into a Blitzkrieg. The Allies were taken completely by surprise. The British and French armies were soon reeling before the sheer speed and power of the German advance and were forced back. The German armies quickly reached the French Channel ports only the miraculous escape of British forces from Dunkirk prevented their annihilation. Within six weeks, France had fallen. Hitler was convinced that Britain would ask for peace. But Churchill and the British people rejected the idea and decided to fight on. They prepared for an immediate German invasion, but Britain had left most of its heavy weapons behind in France. Indeed, given the narrow English Channel, the invasion of Britain seemed a relatively simple operation. But if it were to succeed, the Luftwaffe would have to gain air supremacy over southern England. Goering was confident he could do so quickly. Hugh Dowding realized that only his RAF fighters could thwart Goering and the invasion threat. Both men would call on their personal experiences of World War I air warfare in the coming battle. Born in 1882, 
Hugh Dowding was the son of a British headmaster and was educated at Winchester College in England. He joined the British Army at age 17 and was commissioned into the Royal Artillery. After a varied military career abroad, he learned to fly and joined the newly established Royal Flying Corps. Dowding distinguished himself both as a pilot and commander during World War I. He led a squadron in 1915 and rose to the rank of Brigadier General in the fledgling Royal Air Force by November 1918. In the early 1930s, Dowding served in a key post, head of the supply and research branch of Britain's Air Ministry. In this post, Hugh Dowding played a critical role in equipping the RAF with the modern aircraft and technology that would be vital in 1940. Two new monoplane fighters came into service, the Hawker Hurricane and the Supermarine Spitfire. Work also began on a line of radar stations that covered the south and east coasts of England. Dowding reaped the benefits of his policies when he took over the newly created Fighter Command in 1936. During the next four years, he worked to strengthen what he became convinced was Britain's most precious asset. He was due to retire in July 1940. But with Britain's survival hanging by a thread, Winston Churchill personally ordered Dowding to remain in command. Known as stuffy and apparently aloof at times, Dowding was an avuncular character and his pilots respected him. Dowding cared deeply for these young fighter pilots who became known as Dowding's Chicks. Britain's survival now rested on their shoulders as well as Dowding's. Hermann Goering was 11 years younger than Dowding. He joined the Imperial German Army as a cadet at age 17. Commissioned in 1912, he fought with courage during the opening months of World War I. He was wounded in early 1915. Goering transferred to the German Air Service and joined Baron von Richthofen's famous Flying Circus fighter wing. He distinguished himself in the skies above the Western Front. His bravery was rewarded with a coveted Pour la Merite medal. After Richthofen's death in April 1918, Goering took over command of the Flying Circus. Goering became disillusioned by Germany's defeat in 1918. He believed politicians had betrayed the country. In 1922, he joined Hitler's fledgling Nazi party. During Hitler's failed Munich Beer Hall Putsch in November 1923, he was shot in the stomach. To Hitler, this commitment to the cause made Goering the perfect combination of war and political hero. Hitler rewarded him with power. Goering reorganized the Stormtroopers, or SA, and more importantly, set up Germany's new air force, the Luftwaffe. Called the man with a thousand costumes, Goering was, in every sense, larger than life. In July 1940, Goering met Hitler to assure him that his air strategy for a successful invasion of Britain was in place. Goering was convinced that his Luftwaffe would soon sweep the RAF from the skies. A grim but resolute doubting and a supremely confident Goering now prepared for their decisive battle. <laughs> 
At the beginning of August 1940, Britain's Hugh Dowding had only 700 operational aircraft and was short on trained fighter pilots. He had to fight to conserve his slender assets. Dowding realized from the beginning of the war that his RAF Fighter Command was crucial to the defense of Britain. But in May 1940, the British government planned to send many of his fighters across the channel to help the French. Chad. He told the air ministry that this sacrifice, which could no longer save France, would endanger Britain. The aircraft were not sent. This gave Dowding a fighting chance of holding off the Luftwaffe. His organization of British Fighter Command was designed to ensure that he could defend Britain and maintain reserves. He quartered the country into fighter group areas. Numbers 13 and 12 groups covered the North and Midlands. Number 10 group, the Southwest. Number 11 group protected the critical southeastern part of the country. This arrangement gave Dowding defense in depth enabling him to maintain a reserve at all times. But with his slender resources, he had to face Luftwaffe attacks from two directions, across the English Channel and the North Sea. Having enough new fighters was not a problem. In May 1940, Churchill had appointed British newspaper magnate Lord Beaverbrook Minister of Aircraft Production. His overhaul doubled fighter production within three months to 100 new hurricanes and spitfires a week. But Dowding still had a shortage of trained and experienced pilots. This limited his availability of operational aircraft. To offset this, he had a priceless asset, an early warning radar system. It consisted of short and long range radar stations on the coasts of Britain. The radars could detect approaching German aircraft up to 100 miles from the coast. The radar operations centers fed this information by telephone to fighter command and group headquarters. Radar gave Britain's fighter command time to identify the flight path of Luftwaffe formations as they gathered over the northern French coast. Once fighter command confirmed details, it would alert the appropriate airfields. Pilots now knew the altitude, distance, and number of enemy planes. Then the designated fighter squadrons would take off to meet the German threat. Ground controllers guided them toward the approaching German bombers. The top secret intelligence center at Bletchley Park also played a role. It was beginning to read Luftwaffe radio messages encoded by the German Enigma cipher machine. Unfortunately, the intelligence it gathered did not give Dowding a clear idea of Goering's intentions. Aware of his command's strengths and weaknesses, Dowding knew he had a difficult task ahead. He had to balance between reacting in force to Luftwaffe attacks and reserving his strength for what he knew would be a prolonged battle. Across the Channel, Hitler was angered by Britain's refusal to make peace. He began preparations for an invasion codenamed Operation Sea Lion. Barges were gathered from all over Western Europe. They were converted to carry troops and tanks. The plan was to transport 200,000 German troops across the English Channel and land them on the south coast of England. Both the German army and navy agreed that for the invasion to succeed, air supremacy was vital. Goering had supreme confidence in his air force. Fresh from German triumphs in Poland and France, he believed that the RAF was no match for the Luftwaffe. 
On June 30, 1940, Goering issued a preliminary instruction. As long as the enemy air force was not defeated, the prime requirement was to attack it day and night, in the air and on the ground, until its destruction was guaranteed. Compared to the RAF 700 fighters, Goering had over 3,000 aircraft, including 1,200 fighters. They were organized into three air fleets. The Luftwaffe fleets were Air Fleet 3, with headquarters in Paris, Air Fleet 2, controlled from Brussels, and Air Fleet 5, based in Norway. At first, Goering attacked British convoys in the English Channel. He wanted to force British fighter command into a battle of attrition and fatally weaken it. Throughout July 1940, the Luftwaffe attacked British merchant ships and harbors, particularly in the narrow Straits of Dover, which became known as Hellfire Corner. The intensity of these attacks forced the British to stop sending convoys across the English Channel, but Dowding refused to be provoked. By early August, Goering realized that Dowding was not biting. Goering drew up a fresh plan, codenamed Eagle Assault. First, he intended to blind Dowding's defenses by destroying the radar stations. Then he would destroy RAF planes on the ground by attacking its airfields, a tactic that had worked well in Poland and France. To carry out these two vital roles in the battle, Goering principally relied on two bombers, the Junkers Ju-88 and the Heinkel HE-111. The Ju-88 could dive bomb, carrying 4,000 pounds of bombs. Its top speed was 286 miles per hour. The HE-111 was also a twin-engine bomber. It could carry 4,400 pounds of bombs and fly nearly 250 miles per hour. Both Britain and Germany had high-quality aircraft. The upcoming battle would demonstrate both their strengths and their weaknesses. Formed in 1935, Hermann Goering's Luftwaffe was superbly trained by August 1940. Many of his air crews had combat experience from the Spanish Civil War and the attacks on Poland and France. Goering had established a very efficient training program, which turned out over 800 new pilots every year. The RAF could manage only 200. Goering had unbounded confidence in his men. There was a large number of them, and in his eyes, they flew the best aircraft in the world. He looked especially to men like Major Adolf Galland and Werner Mölders, German fighter aces who had been in combat since the Spanish Civil War. They would lead the attack on Britain. In contrast, in August 1940, RAF Fighter Command had relatively few combat veterans. Most RAF pilots had seen little or no action in France because Dowding had conserved his forces. Many were still in training. Compared to the Luftwaffe, the RAF fighter pilots were a motley crew. They ranged from upper-class Englishmen to hard-bitten non-commissioned pilots, and pilots from countries around the world. There was even a group of eager American volunteers. <laughs> 
An RAF pilot later recalled that they didn't seriously think they were risking their lives. At the time, reading paperbacks, listening to the radio, playing soccer, or even catching some sleep, that was their life. British Fighter Command's tactics were based on a series of attacks for engaging enemy aircraft, depending on whether they were above, below, or at the same altitude. Their standard formation was based on the three aircraft VIC. A squadron commander would designate a particular type of attack, and his pilots would carry it out as a drill. The Germans had a much more flexible approach as a result of their extensive combat experience. They used a formation known as the Schwarm, or Swarm. This was a system of flying in pairs and fours, which gave German fighters mutual protection and greater flexibility in combat. The Schwarm had been devised by fighter ace Werner Mölders during the Spanish Civil War. It was refined during the Polish and French campaigns of 1939 and 40. The Luftwaffe also had a highly efficient air-sea rescue service, which came into its own during the battles over the Channel. Goering's air crews did have some disadvantages, however. Their bombers were not designed to carry a heavy bomb load. They also lacked the range to be true strategic bombers. Another disadvantage was that the range of the German fighters was very limited. They only carried enough fuel to fly over London for 10 minutes before having to return to their bases in France. Bombers were often left unprotected by fighter escorts and could be easily picked off by RAF fighters. In spite of their air-sea rescue service, the German air crews began to suffer from chronic channel sickness, brought on by the psychological fear of being shot down over the sea. This was exacerbated by combat fatigue during battle. British pilots, on the other hand, had the advantage of operating closer to their airfields. Even if they were shot down, it was likely to be over friendly territory. As for the British fighter planes, the Supermarine Spitfire was powered by the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine and armed with eight 303 Browning machine guns. It was an even match for the principal German fighter, the ME-109. The more numerous Hawker Hurricanes were also powered by the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine and were similarly armed. 30 miles an hour slower than the Spitfire, the Hurricane was primarily used against German bombers. The Messerschmitt ME-109E with two 7.9 millimeter machine guns and two 20 millimeter cannons packed more punch than the British fighters. Its top speed was close to the Spitfires, but it was less maneuverable at altitude. The other German fighter, the two-seater ME-110, was a multifunctional aircraft. It was principally employed as a close escort for German bombers. It was also used on special bombing missions. While the fighters of each side were evenly matched, Goering had a numerical advantage over Dowding. As the Battle of Britain intensified, the pressure on both British and German air crews grew. Hugh Dowding and Hermann Goering were now locked into a critical phase of the battle. Both knew that its outcome would have far greater implications for each of their countries. Soon after dawn on August 12, 1940, German airfields in northern France hummed with activity. 
Pilots and ground crews prepared their planes for what was expected to be Goering's decisive attack on British air defenses. That day, the Luftwaffe launched attacks on five coastal radar stations, three British Fighter Command airfields, and other targets. On August 13th, Goering launched a massive attack against more airfields and radar installations. Although there were now gaps in British radar coverage, Hugh Dowding's fighters still intercepted many German bomber formations and their escorts. After the first two days of Eagle assault, Goering was told by Luftwaffe intelligence that all key British radar stations and eight of its fighter airfields had been destroyed. In fact, the radars were only damaged and were quickly repaired. This allowed Dowding to maintain control of his fighter squadrons. Many of the airfields attacked were not crucial fighter bases. 24 hours later, German pilots met unexpected British opposition. A frustrated German pilot said that German fighting crews soon became convinced that they alone could not force England to surrender. They needed a combined operation of the German Army, Navy, and Air Force. They therefore implored Goering to get more resources to support the invasion. British air defenses primed themselves for further action on August 15th. The Germans returned to attack southeast England. Simultaneously, Goering unleashed his Air Fleet 5 from Norway. Unfortunately, many planes of Air Fleet 5 were shot down. Its defeat ended its role in the battle. In further attacks on August 18th, the Luftwaffe lost another 71 aircraft, but not before they damaged Doubting's fighter bases. Doubting had reached a crisis. His pilots were regularly flying a punishing dawn-to-dusk schedule of four or five sorties a day and were exhausted. 88 of Dowding's pilots had been killed and another 40 badly wounded in just nine days. If the Luftwaffe maintained this pressure, he would not have a credible force to defend Britain. By chance, a brief period of poorer weather followed. Dowding used it to replace some of his exhausted squadrons in number 11 group with fresher units from number 13 group in the north. Goering also changed his tactics. He decided to use more fighters and fewer bombers to ensure that RAF fighters were overwhelmed in the air. The next phase began on August 24, 1940, with major Luftwaffe attacks on British airfields, operation centers, and the Portsmouth Naval Base. That night, German bombers accidentally attacked London against Hitler's orders. This mistake would influence the outcome of the Clash of Warriors. In response, Prime Minister Winston Churchill immediately ordered a bombing raid on Berlin. RAF Bomber Command carried it out the following night. Mm -hmm. 
German high command in Berlin worked long into the night to decide what to do. Hitler ordered the Luftwaffe to conduct reprisals. British cities were to be attacked by day and by night. In the meantime, the Battle of Britain hung precariously in the balance. By August 26th, Goering had lost over 600 fighters and bombers. Hugh Dowding's fighter command had lost 260 fighters. At the end of August and beginning of September, 103 fighter command pilots were killed and 128 seriously wounded. Dowding was becoming concerned about mounting losses. And Goering's attacks on British air bases were increasingly successful. Many of Dowding's aircraft were being destroyed on the ground. Key airfields were out of action for days. Against the relentless Luftwaffe pressure, Britain was beginning to lose fighters faster than Germany, almost 500 in two weeks. Dowding's staff acknowledged that those two weeks were the worst for them because by the last week in August, the Germans had been pounding the RAF airfields mercilessly. August 31st was probably their worst day. Goering's principle of applying relentless pressure appeared to be working. In particular, the Luftwaffe's airfield attacks were disrupting Dowding's command, control, and communications. Without these, Dowding could not stop the destruction of his command. As the German attacks continued, Dowding began to doubt that British fighter command could hold out. On September 7, 1940, Britain was placed on invasion alert. Operation staff, pilots, air crews, and the men and women of the coastal anti-aircraft units braced themselves for the anticipated German onslaught. As the day wore on, the tension rose. But all remained quiet. Finally, in the late afternoon, Goering mounted the biggest air armada of the Battle of Britain. Almost every available Luftwaffe fighter and bomber was launched in Goering's decisive attempt to defeat RAF Fighter Command once and for all. Dowding's headquarters confirmed this massive attack. He ordered his fighter squadrons up into the air to meet the threat. The British pilots sent to face this attack doubted that they could keep the enemy from getting through and causing fatal damage. It looked as though Goering might finally win. In the afternoon of September 7, 1940, Anti-aircraft guns protecting Southeast England engaged Goering's German air armada. Hugh Dowding assumed it was once more heading for his battered airfields. Then came what Dowding would later call the miracle of the Battle of Britain. The German attack did not head for the airfields as expected, but changed course for London. the Luftwaffe bombed London's docks. 448 civilians were killed and thousands injured. 
Goering had hoped this would draw the remaining British fighters into the air so that he could destroy them. The RAF did as he expected. But the result of the subsequent clash was not what Goering had planned. British fighters shot down 39 German aircraft and lost 31 of their own. It was a narrow victory, but enough for doubting to sense that a major turning point had been reached. During the next week, there was further destruction in London. A thousand civilians were killed, many more injured, and quite a few bombed out of their homes. The battle in the air continued, but the Luftwaffe lost an increasing number of aircraft in the face of fierce RAF resistance. Goering's decision to switch from attacks on airfields to an attack on London gave Dowding and British Bomber Command a crucial rest. British pilots could now concentrate on defending the capital. But Goering told Hitler he remained convinced that Dowding's fighter command was on its last legs and that one more major assault would win the battle. On the morning of September 15th, the Luftwaffe launched another major daylight attack. Over 250 German bombers took part. They expected little or no opposition. But Dowding was ready for them. He put his Spitfires and Hurricanes in the air to meet the German bombers before they reached London and broke up their attack. Doubting's fighters then returned to their bases to refuel and rearm, ready for another German attack if it came. The Luftwaffe did come again in the afternoon. Once more, Dowding was ready for it. This time, the German fighter escorts failed to protect their bomber formation. The results were devastating. Although he lost 27 aircraft, Dowding's fighter command destroyed nearly 60 German bombers and fighters by the end of the day. It was a fatal blow for Goering's pilots. It snuffed out any glimmer of hope for a German invasion of Britain. By the end of the day on September 15th, the RAF had regained command of the air over southern England. Hitler was forced to postpone the invasion of Britain indefinitely. Instead, he turned east toward Russia. Goering, ever the optimist, initially attempted to brush aside the scale of his losses. He insisted he could still destroy the RAF but he had been wildly misinformed about Dowding's losses by his intelligence staff. Furthermore, the limited range of the German fighters had meant that they couldn't give their bombers sufficient protection. 
Goering sought revenge for his defeat by launching a prolonged bombing offensive on British cities at night. Between mid-September 1940 and mid-May 1941, 40,000 people were killed by German bombing raids, 20,000 in London alone. But these attacks, which became known as the Blitz, stiffened rather than undermined British morale. The Battle of Britain was a watershed of World War II. It proved that Hitler's armed forces could be beaten. British Air Chief Marshal Hugh Dowding was undoubtedly one of the great heroes of World War II. His vision and determination saved Britain. After his victory, Dowding was named head of the British Air Mission to the United States. But it wasn't until after the war that the British people recognized how much they owed Dowding. He retired in 1942 and became Lord Doubting the following year. He died in 1970 at the age of 87. Despite commanding the greatest air force the world had yet seen, Hermann Goering, unlike Doubting, never attempted to understand the limitations of air warfare. While he came close to beating Doubting's fighter command, Goering lost because he switched targets at a critical moment and took pressure off Doubting. Goering remained the head of the German Air Force, but he continued to make serious blunders that sent the Luftwaffe into decline. After attempting to seize control from Hitler in the final days of the war, Goering was arrested by the Gestapo. He was then captured by American forces in May 1945. He was put on trial for war crimes at Nuremberg later that year. You must plead guilty or not guilty. Sentenced to death in October 1946, Goering took poison only two hours before he was due to be hanged. The Battle of Britain was a critical turning point in World War II. As long as Britain was still fighting, Hitler could not win the war. When America entered the conflict in December 1941, Hitler's chance of total victory evaporated. The clash of warriors between Dowding and Goering was unique. In every other air campaign in history, land forces and navies played a role in achieving ultimate victory. The Battle of Britain was decided by air power alone. 